Welcome to Software Gone Wild, a podcast focused primarily on SDN as well as everything else software defined. I'm Ivan Piplenyak. You'll find me at ipspace.net where I blog and occasionally do webinars. And today we'll have a routing protocol focused show. And I have two co-hosts. Let's start with a star co-host, Ethan Banks from the Packet Pushers fame. Ethan, how are you doing? Uh, doing pretty well. Thanks for having me on. And uh, oh, I'm looking thanks forward for coming to, uh, on this show. Yeah. <laughs> this will be enjoyable um, because it, it, it delves into a routing protocol that does things I didn't really think you could do. So this is this will be interesting. Absolutely. And my other co-host is a regular, David G. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. How is yourself? Are you well? I'm doing well. I'm starting my road, autumn road trip tomorrow. And after mm-hmm. that, it will be, I don't know how many weeks of SDM workshops all over the world. Hey, hey. How about that? Yeah, so vacations were fun, and now it has started. Indeed. Well, thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. And I've, um, I've read very little of anything about this, so this is all exciting stuff. And let's make it even more exciting. With us is Marcelo Spon. And Marcelo, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us what you're doing, how you became involved in the routing protocols. Yes, uh, Ivan and Ethan, David, first of all, thank you for having me or go here today. You know, your, your, your level of expertise on, uh, on those, this podcast is, is incredible. It's, it's, it's fun to be here. And um, I'm sure we're going to have an incredible time today. Well, you know, I, I'm the, a founding member of Adara Networks, and I'm currently the chief scientist. We develop uh, SDN solutions. We have production-ready SDN platforms, and uh, I'm responsible for developing the advanced networking platforms at Adara. I, I, I became, uh, I, I'm essentially, I have worked in my entire career in networking, it all started at the university, and especially when I did my uh, graduate studies with um, at, back at UCSC under the supervision of JJ Garcia Luna Salles. In back in, in, in my graduate studies, I did research in wireless and mobile networking, especially in routing protocols, the unicast and multicast routing protocols. And uh, afterwards, I, I started working for a company called Rooftop Communications that was acquired later by Nokia. And Nokia started a division that's called, that was called Nokia Wireless Routers. And there I, I was the, uh, the lead network protocol engineer. At Nokia, we, um, I continued to work on developing a wireless IP router that we started at Rooftop. And then came Adara. Perfect. Thank you. Another guest we have on the show is Raghu Gangi. Did I get this right? Yes. Yes, Ivan, you are right. So what are you doing? First of all, thank you very much for providing this opportunity to be on your podcast. I listen to your podcasts and read your blog posts and find them very informational. And uh, even Ethan, I read your blogs too, and I find them very useful. I'm in Dublin, California, and it's pretty early in the morning. So coming back to my introduction, uh, like I work as a principal engineer at Adara. I I lead the team for the switching platform. Uh, I'm also involved in collaborations with open standard communities like uh, ON Labs and ONS. So we participate in some applications over SDN. And uh, we try to use uh, DLSP in various applications and try to extract uh, more out of SDN. Uh, we basically provide production ready and vendor neutral solutions from Adara. It has various uh, use cases like we do VAN, we do virtual CPUs, we do virtual network functions. Uh, my work mainly involves uh, uh, working on uh, SDN and cloud open flow switches built on Trident 2 platform. We use open flow data plane abstraction SDK from uh, Broadcom. And uh, yeah, I, I take the complete ownership of the production code from the development team at Adara. Okay, so I have to ask the question. Are you working with white box switches or do you ship your own switches? 
So we we actually have both. Uh, our software doesn't have anything specific to Adara, but we are a ODM. So we have our contract manufacturer who manufacture white boxes for us. But that doesn't mean we don't work on other white box switches. We are based on Oni and the normal Linux with Broadcom SDK. So we work on everything, every white box switch based on Trident 2. So effectively, your company is making software. And if someone wants to buy a hardware product from you, you just take it from ODM, put your software on it and ship it as Adara branded switch to the customer. Exactly. That's right. And we also work on Tomahawk as well. So um, those are the two leading Essex in the industry as of now. And you are using, if I understood correctly, the open flow to program the actual switching hardware? Exactly. Yes. And then I'm guessing that whatever is on the north side of this open flow, the controller is then using DLSP as the routing protocol with other instances around the network. Uh, yes, uh, like we call it path computation engine, but internally it's powered by DLSP with all its uh, QoS awareness. Mm-hmm. So when you call it path computation engine, do you mean what the industry means by PCE then, or are you just using the same terminology and it's actually you know, because it's something different on the back end. It's very different in the back end. Uh, so it's more to put in line with the industry terminology. But we have specific features which are more uh, dynamic and uh, which kind of uh, segregate uh, different layers in the networking architecture these days, like the optical layer, the packet layer, and the applications on top of it. So our PC. Uh, Like the DLSP is very programmable. It can see the different layers and compute the path effectively and push the flows accordingly into the hardware using the controller. Okay. So is the controller running on each switch and then running DLSP between the switches? Or is the controller a centralized thingy somewhere that is controlling a group of switches and run DLSP with itself? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So we have uh, both the architectures. We have some customers who request uh, that they can't have the latency of the switch communicating to the controller or the network, which actually increases the latency in all the packet in, packet outs, and uh, uh, like event notifications, etc. So our controller is actually highly scalable, distributed, and it's cluster-based. So we have an instance where we run controller on every switch. Uh, we also have uh, a distributed cluster of controllers which manage somewhere between 100 to 200 switches. Uh, but the controller can scale up to, uh, we tested up to 5,000 switches. It works perfectly fine. So both modes are supported based on the customer needs. And uh, you mentioned DLSP a number of times. Mm-hmm. Where would DLSP fit into this picture? Uh, that That's a nice question. Uh, like uh, be, before going into DLSP, I think it's better to understand what basically the DLSP does. Uh, mm-hmm. Marcelo, can you please go ahead and explain? Yes. DLSP, it's, it's going to compute um, multiple paths. And uh, the paths, they, they may be of unequal cost. So DLSP makes, uh, besides computing multiple paths of an equal cost, DLSP also is going to probe periodically the performance of the links with its peers. So that means that it's going to find out dynamically in real time, what is the bandwidth of your router? What is the, the latency? What is the available bandwidth? If we are talking about an overlay network. And what is the error rate? Uh, so uh, the link metrics are computed dynamically, and uh, the, the routing protocol disseminates this information in a different way uh, that's, that's not based on topology flooding to its peers, and computes the multiple paths, the multiple shortest path trees, you can say. And so with this information, then uh, the, the switches are able to, to, make the, to apply the QS policies that you specify for the applications. 
So, so are those is this all distributed where each individual node is running a DLSP instance and from its own point of view, uh, running these probes, determining link performance, determining available bandwidth, et cetera? Or is it, you know, handled from a central controller that instructs the DLSP nodes to perform these actions or? Yeah, Ethan, that, that's an excellent question. DLSP is a completely, completely uh, distrib- distributed routing algorithm. It doesn't rely on, uh, on the controller for anything. Essentially, uh, you, so it's, it's a completely distributed routing protocol. And uh, when you deploy the, when you, when, when you configure the, 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 the router, essentially the only thing that you need to say for DLSP is, you know, hey, you should work on this set of interfaces or this set of tunnels. That's it. Self-tuning is self-adjustable to everything. And um, as I said, it, it does not rely on any central point of you know, management configuration. It can it, it runs, you know, like, like any other routing protocol, like OSPF, right? It's a completely distributed routing algorithm. So to tie this back with your SDN architecture, if your SDN controller is using OpenFlow with the uh, controlled switches, then those switches are obviously pretty dumb. So does that mean that you are running DLSP between individual controller instances and establishing sort of a federation of controllers with DLSP? Ivan, that's a very nice question. So actually, let me explain you a little bit more in detail. Uh, Like we have scenarios where uh, the switches use some legacy platforms like VxWorks with not such much horsepower. In that case, the DLSP can run as an application on top of controller, and it identifies each switch based on the DPID, and it can use uh, OpenFlow's packet-in, packet-out messages to send the probes or the hello packets or the LSAs uh, to exchange the routing information. And also it can use the OpenFlow metering to do the rate limiting and QoS uh, controls. Uh, as well as uh, it can get the statistics using the OpenFlow statistics uh, messages. So it basically depends uh, on what kind of equipment we are running on. Uh, If it is uh, a Linux-based white box where uh, the DLSP can run directly on the switch itself, then it's good and it's, it's by far the best way to run it but it doesn't eliminate us from running it on controller. But yeah, there are some latencies that are involved when DLSP packets are sent back and forth uh, through the controller to the switch. Uh, We have some adjustments in latency calculation that we can do uh, based on the probes that we do between the controller and the switch uh, for it to program the flows and send the packets out. So does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So the ideal use case is that you have DLSP running on each individual physical box. Mm -hmm. But if you can't do that, then you can run it through the controller and you adjust for the latency between the controller and the switch. Exactly. So uh, in fact, uh, what we do is uh, DLSP can talk to the traditional legacy protocols. It can redistribute the route from OSPF, BGP, and uh, it can switch between uh, SDN island and the legacy island. So it, it's like uh, you can you can run it on controller and speak to the legacy uh, legacy networking protocols. Uh, uh, and also, you know, uh, we have a, we have a several different form factors. We also have a DLSP running in uh, x86 platforms in bare metal or as a virtual appliance. So in, in, we have a, this embodiment of the routing engine that does not need to rely on a, a, an open flow controller. So uh, on, this, on this form factor, DLSP is, it, 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 can, it can run, as, as I said, as a virtual appliance, and uh, where you can provide QoS, um, QoS routing um, on, on the WAN, so without needing an open flow controller. So this is a good segue here into the QoS routing element of this. Um, Now, if we talk about software-defined WAN, what that means to those vendors when they – they wouldn't use the term QoS routing. They would say application-specific routing. 
is they'll identify an application by some means. They, they vary by platform and then make a forwarding decision based on some policy that's been sent to them by the controller. This link looks good for this sort of a flow. I will forward across this link. Now, when you mean when you say QoS routing, I mean the, the SD WAN guys can get very granular with the kinds of applications that they wish to forward in some particular way. Uh, but in a distributed routing protocol like this, when you say QoS routing, what how many classes of traffic can you make unique forwarding decisions for, and then how are you identifying that traffic? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well. We support uh, QoS based on several constraints, such as you know you can specify you can a um, policy requirement for an application based on the latency of a path, or based on the bandwidth of a path, or a combination of both latency and bandwidth. You can say, hey, uh, for this application here, I want you to map sections of this application to a path whose bandwidth is at least 10 megabits per second. And whose, late, and, and whose latency is at most 50 milliseconds, for instance. So whenever a new session arrives, the, the forwarding engine is going to map a session to a path whose uh, a performance is you know, closest to what you specify in the policy. And uh, you, you can also, you can also uh, specify emission control policies for the session. You can say, hey, for this class of application here, I want you to reserve you know, at least 2 megabits per second. But another very critical thing here is that, you know, you don't need to worry about doing traffic engineering here. You just need to, the user just needs to specify what are the, the, the dependent requirements, the latency requirements of the application, and the LSP and, 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 and the multi-path forwarding engine is going to take care of mapping the session to the right path. And the core of this is of being able to provide this kind of QS awareness is that the routing protocol, the LSP, probes constantly, in real time, the performance of the paths. And then this allows, allows us to work, uh, for instance, um, to, to use simultaneously uh, multiple circuits with different properties, with different transport protocols. For instance, you can have a branch connected to a, a, a data center using um, a list line, an NPLS link, as well as broadband links all together. So with TLSP, we're able to use all these links, all the paths over these links simultaneously. And, and, and because of the, of the way that we, 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 we compute the performance of, of the paths, we can make use, utilization of the, of, of, of the broadband links in pretty much the same way that we do for list lines. So if, if a broadband link now, we see that they're perceiving that we can, we can route voice over it because the latency is good. They're going to route voice over it. And this has, this has several implications, especially in, state, in terms of saving money, so reducing costs. Okay, but coming back to Ethan's question, now you said you can specify voice has these requirements or SAP has these requirements. But somehow the switches have to identify what voice is or what SAP is. So are you using uh, diff serve code points to do that or are you using flow specs? Uh, yes, even you can specify the, the application in several ways, what you call policy selector. You can use a diff serve code point to identify the, the application or you can use a combination of port numbers, uh, IP addresses, subnet addresses, you can say all the traffic that comes, for instance, from this subnet here, you know, should be mapped to a path with these properties, with these forms. You can also specify a uh, DPI rules. So you can say we have a DPI engine. So you can say, hey, all the traffic that all the sky traffic should be mapped to uh, such a path with such properties. So the policy selector is you, you can have a combination of these. You can have a combination of port numbers and IP addresses or subnet addresses, this or code point, and as well as a, a, a DPI rule. Now, when you say we have a DPI engine, you mean in the Adara ecosystem, you could use a DPI engine that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with DLSP, but use that data to inform DLSP? Or are you saying that there's a DPI engine built into DLSP itself? Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a separate, uh, it's a separate product. 
yeah, it's kind of a service chain that you can do. So the DPI can feed into the DLSP. Okay, so am I right in understanding that from the user perspective, you can say, this is how I identify the application. This is the requirements for this application. And then DLSP takes over and dynamically propagates the requirements throughout the network. And then every node in the network would find a path or a set of paths that meet those requirements and can be used for traffic forwarding. Uh, the, the policies, the, the QS policies, as well as the, which, which is essentially the, uh, they are all pushed to all the devices that are on the network. So all the devices, they, they know uh, how to identify a particular application. Awesome. So is someone then a master in the system? Uh, in theory, you could do a policy on multiple devices and have conflicts and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. there is what we call a, a, a network designer, which is a, a tool a, so that every router connects to, to pull the configuration, the policies. Uh, so you, we use this tool to configure these the global policies and then when you, uh, when, you, when you change the configuration, this tool is going to push the change to all the, de to all the devices. Yeah, and apart from that, we have a concept of a global policy as well as a local policy. So a few policies can be applied to all the uh, routers in the network, and few can be applied only at the edge or at the entry points. So it all depends on what, what the use case is. Like we use both the, both the configurations. But the distribution of policies is done sort of on the management plane, right? Yes. Yes. So it's not part of the DLSP routing protocol. That's correct. So I'm guessing that within the routing protocol, you're just saying I have these X traffic classes and well, traffic classes are whatever is defined somewhere else. And this traffic classes have these requirements. And now let's find paths that meet these requirements. Exactly. Okay. So, so how, what I'm trying to get my head around this is, um, how quickly a, a network landscape can change. Do you ever come across any conditions where you have like a relay race where packets make it across a network, the conditions change, and then you inadvertently form a loop. So, so how does all that work? Oh, okay. I mean, that, that, is there end-to-end -end yeah. signaling as well? I mean, I, I, yeah. I can't quite get my head around some of this yet. That, that's a very good question, yes. Uh, then we are talking about uh, the overlay networks uh, where the other uh, routers are connected uh, with, with tunnels, IPsec tunnels. Uh, what, what happens here is the following. The DLSP is tight, tightly integrated with the multi-path for the engine. You can, you can think that uh, we have like in-band signaling on these tunnels, like what, what between the edges of the network, the, the routers connect to the edges, meaning that we have some. Uh, what, what happens is you can think that we have you know, like visual signals between the data routers. Okay, we have some signaling that does that mimics that, meaning that we uh, uh, when uh, have every data router uh, is going to the multi path for the engine is going to keep track of the utilization of the links of the tunnels. And if the utilization of a link with a peer starts to uh, exceed a, a congestion threshold, then this, inf this information, this, this, this utilization of the link is propagated to all the routers that are using that link, have, they have sessions mapped to that link. So all the routers get to know what, you know, that the, the, the congestion threshold has, is, has been exceeded. What happens then is every router that is using a session map to that link, they are going to try to reroute the sessions to least congested links. So that's essentially how, how it works. We have, we have, we have in-band signaling on these IPsec tunnels, uh, and, and, and the forwarding engine also has, has it, you know, it's not just, the LSP runs at, at the application layer. The foreign engine in the kernel is going to have some also in-band signaling with, with its peers to get to know what's going on on the tunnel with, with its peers. Okay, and then I imagine then you, you can move some of a load from an interface to, an, to another path. So you could, say, maybe move a couple of flows from one path to another. 
Um, I mean, you, you don't want to be in a position, do you, where like TCP synchronization, where you know all of a sudden all all traffic of a certain kind goes down one interface, and then because it's hit a threshold, all of it's moved to another interface. Oh yes, no, that, that, that's correct. We are very conservative in, in that regard. So the goal is to stick a session to a path and leave it there as much as possible. And if we do need to do the rerouting because of congestion, for instance, then you move to a path that we are sure that we can, you know, can, can hold that session, try for that session. And, 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 and we can do that because we know in real time, uh, first of all, what's the bandwidth of, of, of the path? And what is the estimated available bandwidth? So we have a way of identifying essentially on an overlay network what kind of a notion of what is the cross traffic going on the underlay network. And that's why you can remap the sessions to another path uh, you know, without disturbing the, for instance, the TCP. Interesting. So, so we you... kind of maintain s- session stickiness, and w- only at the last resort we try to reroute it, an existing session. We try to uh, usually use a new session to route on a less loaded path, unless the existing link becomes so under overutilized that we need to reroute a new session. Yeah, like you said, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Being more conservative. Um, so I, I guess in summary then, and, and just shoot me if I'm a bad person for saying this, it, it's like a more dynamic RSVPTE, isn't it? Yes, you could think in that way uh, and without the need for configuring, you know, right? Sure, so, yeah, I like yeah, that. The, <laughs> the, the, that's, that's the major contribution of, 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 of this uh, routing solution, you know? Simplify the, the, the deployment on, on, on WAN links with a similar costs. And, and, and then provide QoS without needing to do traffic engineering. Yeah, if you think of it in a way, it's kind of combination of uh, policy-based routing with uh, RSVP traffic engineering and the very efficient routing protocol, which uses partial link state. So if you see the numbers of the convergence and the chattiness of DLSP, it is way more efficient than any existing protocols. Uh, for example, uh, if you take it, it actually is almost 50% faster than the uh, distance vector uh, protocols. And uh, it's very, very less chatty. It almost takes uh, 23% uh, fewer updates than done in LSAs and uh, 80% less than the link vector algorithm. So it's, it's very, very efficient. It doesn't uh, flood the full topology state into every node. Uh, it it is basically a partial link state based uh, thing. Okay, before we go into those interesting topics, uh, let me just try to recap what I understood so far and what you just mentioned. At every node, you have the definition of what the policies are. And as you said, you're using that for PBR in double quotes. And then you have multiple unequal cost paths to which you could map a certain class of traffic for a certain destination. And there, your routing protocol generates something that looks like multiple tunnels going to the same destination, if we are speaking now in MPLSTE terms. And you're shifting the ratios of how traffic shift between these tunnels based on the actual state of the links. Exactly. Yes, that's very, very right. By the way, uh, now that I mentioned MPLSTE, do you need any special encapsulation between your devices or is it just plain IP and you just use the same PBR rules on every box to get the packet to the right destination? Yeah, it's, 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 it's just a plain IP. Uh, the encapsulation is uh, uh, based on, on vanilla IPsec. Uh, so, and also, uh, like, one more interesting thing is uh, we can use any LSPs that are set up uh, by an MPLS provider. Uh, actually, we came across an interesting use case where uh, uh, the DLSP can take uh, advantage of uh, something like an optical express path, which can be established by optical circuit switches. So that's very interesting. Like uh, within your network, if you have a segment which can be established by uh, programming simple flows into the optical circuit switches, 
the DLSP can take advantage of them and establish that path. So it effectively is kind of we DLSP has a capability of segmenting the network into multiple segments and uh, fit the best possible what is say in open flow terms flows into the corresponding switches based on its capabilities and then use them and uh, router switch the packets. Mm, did you just say that you're interacting with GMPLS and set up optical paths on demand if that's available? That's right. Mm, that's cool. So we are we are working with one of the vendor who who can actually who has a very innovative way of uh, doing optical circuit switching at the light. So their uh, uniqueness is that we don't need to convert the optical packet into an electrical thing where you introduce a latency. So if you have a scenario where uh, uh, you need to do high traffic intensive activity, uh, you can actually set up an optical express path uh, using DLSP working as a PCE and then the data can be forwarded and the path can be disassembled after the tra- transfer is done. But it's still optical switching, so it's lambda in, lambda out, right? Exactly, yeah. It's it's kind of a reflection. It's like a mirror yeah. where you, you switch the optical. You can't touch the packet in transit, right? No, we can't modify it. It's just switching, yes. Now I'm waiting for the optical gear to be able to actually switch packets, but I don't think it will happen anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that would be interesting. I have had more questions around the actual implementation of um, DLSLP. Um, in terms of itself as a, as a protocol, then, how is it actually implemented and how does it appear on the wire? DLSP? Uh, oh, DLSP is, is implemented on, on top of uh, a, a UDP and TCP. So, okay. Uh, it, it, DLSP, it sends the probes, like, uh, you know, um, DLSP periodically send, uh, send hello packets, uh, like in packet trains, with peers to to measure the bandwidth, to estimate the bandwidth and available bandwidth. Uh, so it, the the probes are these LO packets. These trains are sent on on over on UDP, and uh, some of them are sent uh, in clear text. Some are sent on you know IPsec uh, encrypted. Uh, and uh, uh, the DSP also uh, for, to, to exchange the the, the link state updates with these peers. It does that through a TCP connection. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, interesting. You just touched on something there as well, which is quite interesting. So the way that um, so the way that DLSLP will figure out the capabilities of an interface and different classes, is this something along the lines of it will kind of generate synthetic traffic? And, and it's slightly different than the competition, isn't it? Or let's say the, the standard way we think about it, where um, the, the size and, and say the streams of the traffic can be generated differently to try and figure out that you know the kind of I, I guess the characteristics of a circuit. Right. Oh. Yes. What, what what happens is the uh, the DLSP it, um, it 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 sends these you know packet trains uh, with different uh, sizes, I mean, different number of packets, and the size of each packet on, on, on belonging to the train also changes. So, for instance, it, if it, if it identifies in a, in a couple in a very few couple of, of runs, if it identifies that you know, for instance, a T1 circuit. Is going to send the, the, the probes in a, in, a, uh, in a very low rate compared to if you had a 100 megabit link, for instance. Uh, so it you know it itself adjusts to the, to the characteristics of the medium. Uh, so yes, the packet trace, but we, we use there are several uh, approaches uh, on, on the academia or commercial available for estimating the, the bandwidth, right? But the, the novelty here on, on, on the LSP side is that. This probing is, is not intrusive. We send uh, these trains you know, there as well, and we send them periodically by default every 10 seconds. But the, the, the overhead, the communication overhead, is negligible. Uh, so the novelty is in you know, how to make use of these trains, and, 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 you know, and there are several heuristics, to, and then to estimate what is the capacity of the link. And, and then also, what is the available value? Yeah, and just to reinforce that, uh, we actually did the implementation for a satellite communication based on TDMA. 
and Marcelo actually has done the changes of spreading these trains across different time slots uh, because the SATCOM has a different way of working. And so it kind of, uh, you need to send packets across different time slots in order to reserve those time slots for your equipment. So uh, I can say that DLSP is uh, very customizable based on different needs of the network. Like you have different needs for an optical network. You have different needs for satellite communication or the normal packet network. And one more important thing, like from the earlier question, uh, DLSP uses TLV-based uh, packet exchanges. So you can actually, in principle, you can exchange any information that you want. It, it's just like ISIS in that perspective. So, oh. Which brings me to the question of address families and the obvious question, does it work for IPv6? Ah, be me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the current, the, the current implementation, no, that it, it, it works on uh, IPv4 only. That's on, that's on the roadmap, though. But if it's TLV-based, it's just adding another address family, right? Yes, but there is more work involved in that regard. Um, so yeah, but essentially it, it doesn't require that much effort, but, um, yes, it's, it's, well, it, it's one thing to carry IPv6 as an address family, but it would be another to do probes and so on and have the control mm -hmm. plane run over IPv6. So w which elements of that are on the roadmap? Well, on the roadmap is supporting a dual stack. So it's, it's, it's really supporting, you know, uh, two stacks simultaneously. And then you will, as Ethan mentioned, do probes over IPv4 and IPv6 in parallel and independently? Oh, yes. Now, the, the idea is that it is to replicate all the functionality in IPv6. So you, you are going to do, we are going to have the same functionality. The, the control plane is going to work the same way as we do in IPv4. Yeah, that's we an have... interesting question. Uh, so, uh, like, it, it could be possible that the latency measurement that we can do in one can be used for the other because it's the link utilization. So that's a very interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you are working on physical links and uh, you have your nodes on both ends, then I totally agree with you. You should reuse mm -hmm. the latency results. But if you're working over tunnels, there are cases where one of these protocols is faster than the other. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. so then you're going to have you're going to have a tunnel, for instance, that is on running on IPv6, another tunnel running on IPv4. Each yeah, each one of them are going you're going to have to do the problem on each one of them. And um, as a matter of fact, you can have, you can even have two tunnels running across the same physical path. The way the, 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 the algorithm works is that it's going to treat, you know, the, like the second one was, it's like cross traffic. And, uh, and, and they, there is some self adjusting uh, mechanism there to deal with that. So that should not be a problem. What? Just thinking about this, you could do a variant of happy eyeballs and just send the traffic over whichever tunnel is faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. By the way, previously you mentioned something called uh, partial SPF. That's correct. What's that? Yes, uh, that's that's even is the following. Uh, for this OSPF, it, it relies on topology flooding, right? Every node inside of an area is going to know the state of all the links in that area. First, uh, the LSP it, it assumes a, 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 a flat network model. Uh, you can have a hierarchical routing if you want, but the assumption is, 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 is a flat network. And uh, what happens is the LSP is going to report to its peers only the state of the links that are part of one of the, the shortest track uh, path trees computed. So if it, a link is not you know, in one of the shortest path trees computed, that link is not going to be reported to its peers. So that's why the, the nodes, they have partial link state information. So if, if, if the cost of a link changes, so if you are the head of the, head of the link, of course, you're going to report your peers the change of cost of the link. But the peers, they are only going to relay that, the state of that link to other peers only if the node itself uses the link in one of its trees. Otherwise, 
so the state of that link is not propagated yeah and that makes it uh, very less chatty and that also makes you free of configuring different areas and because ospf is basically divided into multiple areas in order to reduce the chattiness uh, like uh, since you distribute your link state database across all the nodes in an area so it it is a huge set of information and in a bigger network that becomes too much of uh, lsp packets that are going through your network so since this novel way of uh, just identifying the affected nodes and propagating that information only to them actually makes dlsp converge much faster than any other uh, routing protocol this sounds almost like a mix between distance vector and link state routing <laughs> yeah, that's correct yes yes that, that's 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 the end result Did one of you not work with somebody who uh, worked on the IGRP? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so let, let that one slip. Actually, Marcelo, like, uh, Marcelo, uh, uh, JJ designed the IGRP, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, JJ is, uh, was my advisor uh, back at UCSC. He developed the, the algorithm that is the core of EIGRP, which is called DUO. Uh, diffusing update algorithm. That algorithm, EIGRP, is, it, is the one that um, you know, it, it determines uh, whether a routing update should be generated for a given prefix. And it, it, it essentially is, it, is the, it prevents the routing loops from, from forming EIGRP. Yeah, so I, I work with JJ, and um, JJ essentially was, was my mentor here. But the big difference, if I understand what you're doing, is that in EIGRP or any distance vector protocol, every router is propagating the cooked information. So what it is using from its forwarding table, whereas what you're doing is you're providing selective raw information. That's correct, yes. And uh, the, the routers only report the state of the links, nothing else. So it's up to each node to, to run this distributed routing algorithm to decide, you know, whether or not that, that thing is going to be part of one of the shortest path trees. And now also another, another important thing to consider is the following. You know, somebody could say, hey, EIGRP also can do multipath routing over paths of a similar cost. And the answer is yes, but, you know, in, in a very limited way. And uh, even on, on, on very small topologies, EIGRP can only use, you know, a, a subset of the paths of the available paths because of, of the way of it, 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 this loop prevention algorithm works. And, 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 and DLSP, on, on the other way, can make use of all the possible paths. Another thing is that EHRP, all the link metrics, they're static, statically configured. So if you want, for instance, to, to do traffic engineering, you will have to go there and you know and, and, and configure the, the, the metrics of each link in order to, to make it, you know, that path the preferred path for some for a given class of traffic. In the LSP, no, in LSP, all the link metrics are computed dynamically. The user doesn't need to never ever, you know, configure anything in that regard. Interesting. Um, so I, I guess then um, the ability to use all of those paths is is that absolutely relying on OFDPA to achieve that? No, um, not, not not really. I'm sorry, Rebu. Uh, no, go ahead, think, Marcelo. Yeah, there are two two frameworks. One is where We work on, on, let's say, on the x86 platform, and the other one where we work on on, on the, uh, okay. the uh, switch side. You know, so so we we can't obviously do everything that we can do on an x86 on an ASIC, but we try to mimic most of the features. Like our uh, x86 forwarding module, which is actually very uh, very different from any traditional uh, forwarding uh, element. It does a lot of session-based, uh, like you said, the session stickiness, everything can be done there. So it's much well, more effective. Oh, yeah, this, this is a very important point, uh, uh, is, you know, is that the forwarding engine on the x86 platform is completely session-based, meaning that with the head switch now that is connected to the source of a new session, for instance, it maps you know, the session 
to a given uh, path. And uh, this, there is an inline band signaling, making sure that that session is indeed mapped to all the intermediate routers until it gets to the tail AR, other router. So, you know, it's session-based routing. It, it's not, you know, packet-based routing. That's, that allows to, you know, that's one, 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 the key for doing uh, QS routing, on, on, for instance, on, on, on one side, on an overlay network. Okay, I mean, the x86 module as well, and in terms of performance of the actual data path forwarding, um, is that kind of, you know, DPDK ready? So we are currently working on uh, moving it to DPDK. Currently, it, it, it is a kernel module. Uh, it runs within the kernel space, and the DLSP running in user space actually programs the rules into the kernel. Okay. So we are, we are actually so working on the DPDK, yes. It's going to drive bigger, much bigger performance, I'm assuming, then. Yes. Uh, so it, it actually depends on the actually where we are trying to put it. If you are putting on the WAN side, you probably don't need uh, uh, like a 10 gig throughput or so because uh, most of the customers we work with, they actually have less than 200 Mbps, which we can uh, actually meet with the current uh, forwarding plan. It can actually scale up to 1 Gbps. But yes, we are working on DPDK to enhance it uh, uh, to be at near line rate. Mm -hmm. Is there a standards track for DLSP or does is Adara going to keep this in-house? Uh, we have a plan to make it a standard because it becomes uh, useful. Like once it is a standard, we can interop with any of the vendors and all because the uniqueness is within the implementation. It's not uh, the specification of the packets or the logic or the uh, any such thing. So I think the Adara's uh, IPR is going to be the how we probe the latency and how do we do the implementation of it. So we are working on making it a standard but I don't know how long it's going to take. So but you're saying that... pretty much that, interested in it. Okay. You, you, you could do it as a standard, and then, again, what would be a differentiator from uh, vendor to vendor who chose to implement that standard would be in, in the details. The standard wouldn't be written so granularly and in so much detail that the way the probes are executed would be defined in the standard. Rather... You know, the general framework of DLSP would be defined and then you as a vendor can choose to, uh, you have some latitude in how you actually execute on uh, some of those things. Uh, exactly. So the RFCs are mainly uh, for interoperability so that you understand the packets I send, but how you send the packets and how you measure the link, they, they usually are kept outside the scope of the RFCs. But again, there's no current uh, IETF draft for DLSP. It, it, it's just something that Adar is considering and probably you're going there. But do you have a timeline or? Oh, Marcelo, uh, were you no, working no, on it? Uh, yeah, no, we, no. Right now, yes, we, this was is something that uh, just started. Um, so we don't have a timeline yet. But the goal, the goal is to make, you know, the path computation agent part of DLSP. To, you know, a standard. So, you know, the logic for computing these multiple paths of an equal cost and how to use them, uh, no, we don't have right now a timeline for that. Uh, so since you, you asked this question, so I just want to tell you about some implementations that we are doing with uh, some of the open source communities. Like we are working on uh, developing a PCE framework uh, within ONOS, Open Networking Operating System. Uh, we are collaborating with ONOS uh, for various use cases like uh, data center to data center interconnectivity and also uh, central office re-architected as a data center where you have uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, central offices and you need to interconnect them using packet optical switches. Uh, and DLSP is a perfect fit here because it can understand the packet layer uh, dynamics uh, and optical layer is more kind of a stable thing, but there is no configuration uh, that current uh, implementations can do. They are more of a closed uh, uh, systems. So we are working with them so that we can provide a framework for a PCE 
and any other PC in the market can use that interface to do that. Uh, so we are collaborating with them so that it becomes a kind of a standard way of uh, implementation. Does that mean that there is a DLSP daemon uh, in the wild that's open source that uh, anyone could run and you're, you're using that in coordination with, uh, with Onos? <laughs> that's an interesting question. So what we are trying to come up is with a framework what all hooks the PC needs in a controller to program the switches and what are the high-level intents that can be there. But the actual uh, implementation, we haven't thought whether we want to put it in open source or not. It really, you're at a higher level. You're, you're saying we want to provide a generic PCE framework. The way we'll implement it happens to be with DLSP, but we're just really giving you a way to do path computation uh, generically. And, and also, like, various hooks, like, uh, dynamically inputting the latencies and the oh, link utilizations. Yeah, yeah would, would this not yes. suggest that you'd also need to distribute agents around to generate probes or report back to the kind yes. of centralized PCE? Mm-hmm. I was just trying to go through this in my head. It's a really interesting use case. So, and also, it suggests some um, tracking as well. So, you, like, you, you might have a lot of state kind of stored in one, one place, or obviously maybe in a cluster or something. That's one more thing, like uh, it's kind of uh, uh, DLSP can scale very well and we can actually synchronize the state across multiple instances. So we could have two DLSP, like if controller is running in a cluster mode, then we can have uh, the redundancy so it's not a single point of failure. But uh, yes, uh, so uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you for that. It's, It's really interesting stuff. Uh, I think we could do another show on this as well. It's it's, it's quite a nice (laughs) big area, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah, we definitely have to do a deep dive. Yeah, so just to uh, complete the implementations, we also have some implementation of VCPE where we actually use the zero-touch configuration capability and also using uh, multipathing over uh, dissimilar cost links. So that's one, one very interesting use case where... Uh, we work as a virtual network function, and uh, DLSP is actually doing the hard work. Uh, we also use DLSP in orchestrating our cloud, so it can discover the network, and then uh, we actually do a auto configuration of underlay network. So that's one of the main differentiating points uh, with any existing solutions today. So many of the orchestration systems these days they actually treat your underlay as separate from the overlay. But since we use DLSP, we can bind together the underlay and overlay and provision them together so that we can do an optimal flow configuration. So when you're saying we, is that an Adara private cloud or Adara private cloud product or a public cloud that I can consume? What is it? Yeah, I have this problem of saying we. So we have a cloud management system that's built on top of OpenStack. And we have, uh, like, Adara has uh, a Neutron agent implemented. And uh, we have a PC running on top of it to do SLA-based uh, forwarding, etc. So you can actually define uh, uh, SLAs for your elephant flows and ignore the micro flows, etc., it's a cloud management system uh, that can do all this, which is integrated with OpenStack. Really interesting stuff here. So at a really high level, some of the, the kind of trends at the moment are to base a lot of the decision-making for pass into a controller, call it completely almost into a controller and let the, the endpoint to be done. But, I mean, I think obviously what you've identified is there are other problems to solve around, you know, kind of a changing landscape. And, and you move the intelligence back down into a protocol where you, maybe then the, the interaction with the controller is minimalized and you kind of using that maybe just as a, as a light touch point or a, a central point maybe where you can get some telemetry from or something. Yes, that's right. But uh, when we don't have the flexibility of running DLSP on every switch, uh, we also can take advantage of the open flow semantics and run DLSP as an application on top of controller so that we are totally unaware of what switches we are managing. But we can take more intelligent decisions if we know the capabilities of switches 
very well. For example, if it's an optical switch and we know that it can do more effective L2 switching, but it can't do packet routing. So we have that uh, context knowledge inside DLSP. And uh, what we actually till now thought of is just DLSP can work with probing. We also have a mode of DLSP where it doesn't send the probe packets but can utilize the link statistics and all fetched from the uh, open flow statistics are directly from the hardware if it's running on the switch directly and use that to kind of uh, see the link utilization. So that we actually use in data center environments wherein uh, the networks are very stable compared when running over a van. Very interesting. So I'm going to hit you with one more awkward question, I think, and then I probably need to uh, to go on. I think we're kind of slowly running out of time here. I think so. If you put the controller, if you put DLS, uh, sorry, DLSP on a controller, and then the controller is obviously now, you know, is kind of visible to to traffic on the network. I mean, that then suggests that you've added um, an attack point to the network. So then I, how, you know, how secure is DLS? So I can't even say this DLSP. How secure yeah. is it? And, and how, so d- you know, are there any hardening mechanisms and nerd knobs that you can turn for this kind of, you know, topology where the controller's actually in, almost in the, well, not in the forwarding path, but it's got a listener on the front. So we leverage the flow configuration on the switches uh, so that the packets, the actual data plane packets doesn't come to the controller. Sorry, but, yeah. let, let me rephrase. What, what I meant was, um, how do you prevent other people on the network from targeting the controller to influence, um, you know, I, I want an attack vector. Oh, and now my easiest point of influence is the controller that's running DLSP because I can now influence where packets go. So, you know, have you got any kind of mm-hmm. traditional hardening that you will do in that, that kind of circumstance? And how do you oh. calm nerves of the customers when you suggest that as a, as a route? Oh. Yeah, got it. So sorry for my... Uh, no, it's, it's me. It's my bad English. Just, just yeah, shoot me for it. So sorry. <laughs> actually, actually, one of the implementations of DLSP was in Department of Defense. So it's one of the most secure protocols that we have around. Uh, Marcelo, can you say that... Uh, can you put in more details regarding yes. this? Yes. Uh, so, uh, David, what happens is every single probe, every single packet that LSP sends on the wire is encrypted and authenticated, regardless of whether, you know, you have IPsec or not. Sometimes the peer routers, they may have just a, a clear text tunnel with each other, you know, in the data center, for instance, uh, connected to islands, where you have a, a, a you know, a, a, a secure layer two environment. But every single packet sent by DLSP over UDP or TCP is authenticated and encrypted. And also, the, the encryption algorithm, it, um, well, the, the logic for encrypting is that the key changes every couple of seconds. So you may, you know, like if you try to, repli- to, to replicate, you know, to do a replay attack, that's virtually impossible. You know, like, to, to, like if you try to mimic, like, you know, to be a new peer of a router, you know, if you collect the traffic, whatever, it, even if you figure out the first key, you will not get the next one. So it's, 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 I would say it's virtually impossible for a, a router to post as, you know, a, a, a peer when it's not supposed to be. Yeah, and since we have our deployments in the defense, we were a defense contractor earlier, so we had some security certifications as well. Sure. So, so when, when you would build this then, I imagine then from a provisioning point of view, if you want to go into an environment and turn the boxes on, there must be some pre-configuration work where maybe where you share certs or you share like a seeding key or something to put them in the same network? Yes, that, that's correct. Yes, there is. Yes. Okay. This is cool. Now, if someone wants to know more about your uh, routing protocol, is there something published that I could download and read? Yeah, you can, you can, fo- you can find more information about LSP on the uh, Dara's website. Uh, or you can also be uh, like if you're already collaborating with any open, um, like we have more uh, discussions in ON Labs while discussing the PC framework. You can follow us there. We also occasionally tweet. Uh, we have uh, we attend regularly the meetups, and uh, um, so you can uh, also we are planning to put up some blogs on our website, so you can follow there as well. Okay, so start at adaranetworks.com and explore.
Exactly. And how can people get in touch with you too? Do you tweet? Do you have your personal blogs? Well, you, 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 can, you can follow us on, on Twitter, um, Adara on Twitter. Yeah, it's on Twitter or you can email us to, I think it's support at adaranetworks.com. Perfect. So thank you for being with us. And Ethan, where can people find you? I mean, most of them already know the answer, but you know. <laughs> I am at EC Banks on Twitter. My blog is ethancbanks.com. And of course, I co-host the Packet Pushers podcast, which you can find at Packet Pushers on Twitter or at packetpushers.net. I can't tell you how many times I've been listening to this speech in the last week or so as I was biking around. (laughs) (laughs) And David, where can people find you? So they can find me on my blog at ipengineer.net. I'm also on Twitter uh, at David John G. Um, Yeah, and I'm I'm just generally floating around on the net and I'm an IRC in my old username uh, of LSP42. Ah, so you are making that reappear? Trying to. I'm, I'm in talks with Twitter. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, they've, they've suspended it, and it's just like, oh, can you please unsuspend it? But I'm, I'm not quite there yet. Okay, I hope you'll get it back. It was an <laughs> awesome handle. My, uh, a big mistake, but there yeah. you go. <laughs> and I'm Ivan Pipelniak, and you can find me as at iOS Hints on Twitter or on my website and blog, which is ipspace.net. And if you want to listen to more episodes of this podcast, just go to podcast.ipspace.net and you'll find everything we ever recorded there. And for more SDN goodies, go over sdn.ipspace.net where you'll find the podcast, presentations, videos, webinars, books, everything you need to get a real-life perspective on SDN. Thank you all for being with me. and It's been a great conversation and I hope we'll continue it in the future.